me, mister, do you have the time? Are you so important to stand still for you? Excuse me, mister, lend me your... Thanks for being with us today, Gary. And my first question, was ELT your chosen profession? So, was ELT my um, chosen profession? Well, it was my first full-time job. Um, but at the time, I didn't think of it as a, a career choice or a, or a profession. In fact, I don't think I really thought about a career or a profession at all. Um, I just finished doing a postgraduate certificate in education at university. Uh, I didn't feel like starting a full-time job as a teacher in a secondary school. I did feel like travelling and I guess um, ELT is the obvious choice then, though I didn't really know what it was all about. Um, I'd done one summer school and, and that was about it. So it was very much more about um, where to go uh, rather than what to do. So your first job was in Italy. How come? Yeah, my first job was in Italy. In, um, in L'Aquila, in Abruzzo, in a small family-run school. There were five of us when I joined the school. Um, it was a great place to work. I stayed there for 10 years. And um, why Italy? Well, I studied Italian for a year at university. Um, but it was a very traditional grammar translation type course and I came away not really being able to speak at all. So when I had a chance of um, a one year, well, a nine month contract in Italy, then that's where I decided to go. Janet, Janet Bianchini tells us wonderful stuff about Abruzzo. However, I think she arrived after you had left. Um, tell me, did you ever get to meet her? Yeah, Janet is the, um, the famous uh, adopted Abruzzese on, on Twitter and the blogosphere. And, um, I follow her blog, but I've never actually met Janet. And yeah, I think she um, arrived in Abruzzo after I'd already left. I left in um, 1996 and I've been back a couple of times, but um, not recently, not in the last 10 years, I guess. Kerry, what do you remember from those early days? Hmm. Uh, the early days are a long, long time ago. What do I remember? What do I remember about teaching? Um, wow, nothing very specific. I can remember the school very, very clearly, the classrooms, uh, the setup there, the atmosphere was great. Um, we had a massive variety of classes teaching from primary through to adult, beginner through to post-proficiency in my case, in my first year, that was a real challenge. Um, business, ESP, we taught these great groups up in um, a physics lab under the mountain in Gran Sasso. And um, I think that's what I liked most about it was the massive variety that we got from very early on. Um, and also we had, uh, you usually had four day weeks which was wonderful. Long, long days, but a uh, three-day weekend was fantastic. Most native travellers seem to belong to a colony of migrating birds. Was Italy the first country you moved to? And do you remember any problems you had in the beginning? Yeah, Italy was the first country I moved to. Um, problems? Oof. No, apart from the usual kind of practical things, you know, finding a flat, um, that was difficult, that was difficult. It was, it's a university town um, and uh, when I arrived I was competing with all the students looking for flats to live in um, and some, some of the students at our school helped me uh, look around and I soon found out that the best way to find out about flats was to go to a barber. Barbers always know everything about what's going on. And when I found my first flat, a lovely flat with uh, right in the, t in the middle of the old town with a, a terrace and, um, and a balcony onto the street and uh, I found that through the barber. And when I went to see it, the student came, the barber came, the barber passed by and picked up his cousin on the way and I think there were about six of us by the time we got to see the flat. Um, that's part of the, the whole magic of, um, 
of L'Aquila at the time. You stayed there for a decade, so it must have been good. Uh, what prompted you to leave though? Yeah, that's right. Um, I stayed there for 10 years. I stayed in the same school, in the same town um, for 10 years. And uh, the uh, comers in in L'Aquila used to joke about there being some kind of magnetic power into the mountains that kept us there. There were a lot of um, people would move in and stay long term. Um, why did I decide to leave? Well, 10 years is a long time. Um, I was getting seriously itchy feet. I wanted to try and do something new and um, I guess I'd got to the point where if I didn't leave then, then, then I was never going to leave. Alright, so you left, uh, you did your MA and then you moved to Madrid. Uh, was there any particular reason for this? Um, when I moved to Madrid it was for the job rather than for the city. I didn't know Madrid at all. I hardly knew Spain at all. I'd been on holiday once um, to Cadiz in fact. And um, it was the job that attracted me to Madrid. It was a DOS job, Director of Studies job at an international house school in Madrid. And um, it sounded like a challenge, like what I was looking for at the time. I wanted to um, move back to the south of Europe um, and I think, I mean, you know, it was just one of those right place, right time, that was the job that was on offer and that was the job I took. How did you first get involved in writing course books? Uh, was it easy to juggle teaching and writing? Um, I first got involved in writing um, teaching materials with a friend and teacher in Italy. Um, we wrote a couple of supplementary um, skills books for OUP in the mid-1990s and um, then when I moved to work at IH um, it was kind of a, again, right place, right time, right person this time and uh, an editor that I met um, at an IH conference, was interested in the materials that we'd been writing and um, offered us the opportunity to submit a proposal for Inside Out Advanced. And that was really the first main project that we worked on. We worked on that one together. Um, and um, that was when I had just moved to Madrid. And so we were writing um, at a distance by email um, on the internet um, from Italy to Spain. And um, yeah, it was hard work. I was teaching full time at the time. I was DOSing full time at the time. Um, the writing had to fit in on weekends, uh, late at night. Um, but I was uh, single then, and so there was no kind of family commitments um, to my time. And mm, it, it was hard, but it was fun. It's challenging. Uh, I think it's it's pretty difficult juggling the two things. How long were you in Madrid? Uh, was it hard to live there, uh, being so such a long way from the coast? Um, I lived in Madrid for eight years, and uh, no, it wasn't difficult living so far from the coast. In fact, um, most of my adult life I've lived far from the coast, uh, in the mountains in Italy, in Madrid, in Spain. Um, it's only recently, when, when we moved to Cadiz, that I actually got to uh, to fulfill my dream of coming back and living by the sea. Why Cadiz? Cadiz was um, the first city I visited in Spain. Um, I came on holiday um, just after I'd finished my MA and um, travelled up and down the coast um, from Tarifa to Cadiz. It's a beautiful, beautiful coastline, wild, empty beaches even in the middle of summer. And um, when I came to Cadiz itself, I just fell in love. It's such an amazing place and such fantastic views. The light is phenomenal. And um, yeah, it's a special place. Uh, there are very few places like it. In, in the south of Spain, most cities are kind of set back from the beach. They don't um, look out to sea in the same way as Cadiz does. And Cadiz looks way, way out into the middle of the ocean. Uh, it's, it's a special place. Okay, Kerry, with the knowledge and experience you have now, 
Uh, is there anything you wish you had known before you started on a long journey? And is there anything you would have done differently? Mm, that's a difficult one. Uh, there have been times during my career when I wish I'd moved around more, um, travelled more, lived in more countries, um, Asia for example. Um, South America really, really pulled me after I finished my MA. I was kind of torn between the job in Madrid and a job in Venezuela, and in the end it was um, Madrid that won. Um, and so, but n no, now no regrets at all, I think. ELT is such a strange career, there's no real path or paths even. It's just, for me, certainly it's been um, a question of taking the opportunities as they come up um, and just kind of being willing to explore new directions, uh, take on new challenges. Um, yeah, maybe you have to open doors to challenges, but on the whole, kind of, you just see what crops up, uh, what crosses your path and, um, and, and follow whatever seems to be good at the time. So, hmm, lessons I've learned, I don't know, yeah, the, the ELT is incredibly, incredibly varied and there are so, so many different ways of making a career and each one of us will inevitably choose uh, different routes and hopefully routes um, that suit us and I guess uh, you make it work for you. Yes, ELT is a somewhat strange profession. Some may even go so far as to say it isn't a profession. So, what advice could you give to someone just starting out? Advice? That's a difficult one as well. Okay, uh, how about um, do what you enjoy and enjoy what you do. Um, uh, that is so trite, but um, yeah, I think it works. Hmm. Easier said than done, probably. Now, having been a course writer for some time now, what advice can you give to someone wanting to get into this area of ELT? Hmm. This is a question I've been asked quite a lot. Um, there's, there's no one simple answer and the world of um, textbooks and materials writing uh, is changing and shifting continuously and I don't think um, the publishers certainly don't know really where things are going at the moment. There are certainly huge opportunities for anyone who is interested in materials writing. Um, you can self-publish um, or if you want to approach publishers then um, you can just do as we did. We wrote a, a sample, a proposal for um, a book that we thought filled a gap in the market and um, eventually after a whole round of rejections our materials were accepted or um, you can try, uh, I don't know, entering competitions for lesson plans, lesson materials, there's all kinds of um, outlets for that, uh, writing blogs, making um, some kind of a name for yourself, a profile, a brand for being someone who's um, a thinking, creative teacher, that's, that's definitely um, a first step as well. Going to conferences, meeting people, talking to people, making contacts, that's incredibly important too. I guess having a portfolio of work that you can share as well. Um, as I said, blogs are probably the best place to showcase um, the kind of materials that, that you like writing. And um, hmm, right place, right time doors opening, keeping your eye open for opportunities, I think. I think it's very much the same as any, uh, as any other route through ALT. Okay, Kerry, who has been your greatest influence? I really, really can't think of one person in particular um, that's influenced me. Um, I've worked with so many great teachers and um, materials writers and editors and managers and directors and, and each person you work with influences you in some way or other. We, we pick up even kind of subconsciously um, 
the things that we like about the people we work with, I think uh, that rubs off on us. And so, yeah, uh, the the owners of my first school, um, all of the fantastic teachers I've shared staff rooms with, uh, my my editors who had confidence in me when maybe I didn't have confidence in myself, um, you know. Uh, all of my good friends, you know, everyone, everyone who crosses your path influences you in some way. Lots of teachers are supplementing their course books with material from the internet, of which there are loads. Uh, you yourself share ideas and material in your own blog. When and why did you start this blog? My blog? Um, I started my blog a uh, about a year and a half ago, yeah, it was July 2010. Um, I started it because I was intrigued by the genre, I guess. Um, as a materials writer, we were using uh, blog posts more and more as reading texts um, for materials, and, and I felt like I wanted to know more about um, what it felt like to write a blog post from the inside, not just to fake it, but to do it for real. Um, I also wanted to learn more about blogging in order to be able to do it with my students and with my classes, because um, it has such phenomenal potential, I think, uh, for motivating students, for um, extending their studies beyond the classroom. Um, I had a, a great blogging class last year. Uh, who really confirmed my um, belief in the importance of, of blogs in teaching. And um, I have really got to love writing in the blog. Um, I like sharing lesson plans, lesson plans that I've been using in class, or lesson plans that um, have been my favourites, old, I don't know, oft-repeated plans that kind of surface sometimes when I'm cleaning out a cupboard or uh, going through the files in the computer. Um, it's great. The comments, the reading other people's blogs, I mean, you know, it's kind of, it's become a bit of a, a bit of an obsessive pastime. Kerry's got a great blog called Close Up. Uh, be sure to check it out if you haven't already. Uh, Kerry, tell me, um, what projects are you on at the moment? or will be on in the near future? Right now, um, I'm in the middle of writing some audio worksheets for One Stop English um, to accompany some classic short stories from the Macmillan um, the, what's it called? Literature collections. <laughs> the short story collections um, of original stories which have been um, recorded and the audio is available on one stop with um, accompanying worksheets. Um, in the new year I'm going to be um, involved in editing two new collections for the series. Um, at the same time um, I've just started working on some supplementary um, business English worksheets for the uh, straightforward um, course book series. There's a new edition being launched next year. And um, I'm also involved in another course book series called The Big Picture, which was um, launched with the elementary and pre intermediate levels in uh, Latin America this autumn. And um, yeah, and all three of those projects are going to be ongoing in the new year, so uh, quite a lot of work on at the moment. Now tell me, Kerry, uh, in between juggling uh, two kids, uh, blogging, writing, teaching, tweeting, uh, do you still find time to relax? And what relaxes you? What relaxes me? That's easy. Um, a long walk along the beach, or an afternoon uh, swimming, uh, playing in the surf, building sandcastles with my kids. Um, yeah, that's it. Simple things out in the open air here in Cadiz. Uh, beautiful, beautiful beaches. This leads me to the final question, Carrie, which I also asked uh, Vicky Loras. Uh, if you had a crystal ball 
and gaze at your life in 10 years time, what uh, do you think you would see? Hmm. Crystal ball. Um, 10 years time is a long time. Um, okay. Well, I guess whatever I'll be doing, it'll still have um, something to do with teaching and learning and writing, I guess. Um, I'm really interested in um, getting into the world of e-tutoring um, and I might possibly, possibly have my first chance to do some of that next year, I don't know, still very much up in the air. Uh, so yeah, maybe in 10 years time I'll be uh, e-tutoring and online teaching. Um, I guess maybe we'll still be in Cadiz. Um, our kids are incredibly settled here, but by then uh, they'll both be teenagers and I don't know, maybe the lure of a larger city would have taken us away from the coast. Um, and oof, I, I just hope that, um, that they'll be happy and healthy and we'll still be enjoying uh, the simple things of um, you know, beaches and friends and um, whatever the new online world brings. Well, Kerry, we certainly hope we'll, we'll all be around alive and kicking in, in 10 years' time, lapping up the waves and enjoying the simple things in life. Um, thanks for sharing a uh, part of your life with us today, and I hope to see you uh, in the real world in the near future. Excuse me, mister, do you have the time? Are you so important to stand still?